Uh, can, can everybody hear me all right? All right, ter terrific. My name is Mark Crandall. I handle global regulatory compliance uh, for Google Cloud, specifically G Suite. And I want to talk to you a little, about, a little bit today about data protection and regulatory compliance when using G Suite. Um, a little background, I've been at Google a little more than 10 years. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade and helped launch G Suite as a product 10 or 11, uh, 10 and a half years ago. And I'm part of an engineering team uh, focusing on regulatory compliance. And let's see what we can talk about today. So you don't have to do this by yourself. You can partner with us when it comes to addressing data protection and compliance needs when you move to the cloud. The cloud could be daunting for a lot of folks, but we've been doing it a really long time, and we want you to be able to leverage our experience in helping address this yourselves. Maybe just by a show of hands, how many folks in the audience uh, focus on regulatory compliance or data protection? No, oh, that's terrific. How many folks in the room are lawyers? Good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about four different uh, main themes today. We're going to talk about um, your specific industry that you're in and how you could conduct a compliance assessment of what your regulatory compliance needs may be. Now, you may not be in a regulated industry at all, or you may be working with, or you could be working with European data protection issues, or a bank, or working with healthcare. So the point is helping you conduct that assessment. The next thing we're going to talk about are transparency tools, things that you can focus on to help conduct an assessment of Google Cloud Services, G Suite specifically, so you can conduct a meaningful risk assessment. The next thing we're going to do is talk about contracts to show you where we are taking these obligations we talk about and putting them in writing. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the more common regulatory frameworks that we've encountered over the last decade in providing G Suite services to millions of customers around the world. So let's first focus on compliance assessments. What do you need to look at when you're focusing on your business and the move to the cloud? Now, I'm not going to sit here and talk about every regulatory framework in every country in the world. I don't, I don't think anyone can do that. It would make you crazy and it would make me crazy. If you think there are 190 so odd countries with maybe four or five verticals in each country, you know, personal data, healthcare, educational records, financial services, government, we're talking about what, hundreds of thousands or millions of combinations. So you are the experts in what your own regulatory compliance requirements are for your field. You have your own compliance specialists, you have your own lawyers, and if you don't, presumably you have a general sense of what you've been addressing over the last um, few decades or years that you've been uh, working with data. Um, you know where your regulatory needs are and you know what countries are a priority for you. However, what we can do in, as part of this partnership is that we can bring expertise with regards to how regulatory environments would apply to cloud computing, because we've seen this a lot over the last several years. We also have technical expertise with regards to the services we provide and how they can mesh with what your own regulatory compliance needs are. So there's a partnership. There's also a shared responsibility, right? Because if you're going to be relying on us, really trusting us with your data, then you want to make sure that we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing to help you meet your needs as well. That also means providing transparency into our services, as well as allowing you, and, and, and this is why transparency is so important, to allow you to conduct a meaningful risk assessment of our services so that you can build trust and rely on us for your work. So risk assessment. These are the things you should be asking when you decide to adopt a cloud provider, including G Suite. And I'll show you where you can find access to this type of information as you conduct your risk assessment of G Suite. So obviously, you want to assess our security capabilities. And you want to compare them to what your own security capabilities are right now, as well as what might be expected of you if you work in a regulated market. As much as I'd like you to do this, simply choosing Google just because we're Google is not the reason to be adopting a cloud provider. You want to be able to assess what our security capabilities really are and then make a meaningful risk assessment. Then you want to think about ownership of data. Now, we take the position that any data that you store in G Suite, that you upload to G Suite, is your data. It belongs to you. It does not belong to us. We own the services, and you own the data. The next thing you want to think about is how is the service provider using the data? 
Now, this might not be as applicable if you're not in a regulated market, but in many markets and in many regulatory frameworks, the usage of data is restricted, right? So think about uh, European personal data. If you're a company and you have employees, how that data would or would not be used. Um, if you're dealing with educational records, let's say FERPA in the United States or student records, or healthcare information that might be covered under HIPAA, you want to think about data use restrictions. Uh, we'll talk about it more later, but in G Suite, there are no ads, data is not used for ads, and we provide commitments in our data processing amendment that data will be used for no other purpose than to provide you with the services and to protect that data. The other thing that's important we want to talk about is data incident notification. That's been a really big deal over the last few years, and people may not realize it, but there have been many laws around the world that obligate our customers as well as providers to notify users uh, that might be affected by a data incident. Now, notice I don't say breach, right, because it could be a data leakage, it could be an intrusion, but in any case, if anything unfortunate like that happens, you may have an obligation to notify your customers or your employees. As such, we as the cloud provider obligate ourselves to notify you if something like that ever happens. We hope it never would, but we need to make sure that that is covered. Data portability, providing commitments from your cloud provider that you can take your data and go home if you want to switch providers or just don't like their services anymore. You want to consider that. The other thing to consider, and this again comes to particularly regulated markets, is what type of data you're going to be storing. For example, you might be uh, thinking about a government agency that deals with all types of information and classified information. We wouldn't encourage necessarily to have a customer storing classified data in a, in a public cloud in our systems, notwithstanding the fact that we have fantastic security capabilities. However, a lot of other data that they may be addressing, um, collaboration data, calendaring, document sharing, email, could very well be uh, uploaded and used in the cloud. So what I'm saying is you need to look at the type of data you're dealing with and decide what is appropriate for the cloud per your assessment and what isn't. And we can provide information again regarding our services. I should also note that in many, many situations, moving your data to the cloud from on-prem would end up being much, much more secure than what you could possibly do, right? You've got to realize that. So you have to weigh the fact that the data is likely much more secure in the cloud versus the type of data you would actually be storing. And then hopefully, if there's a nexus between the two, that's what you deploy in the cloud. Um, millions and millions of customers have conducted similar assessments, I would say, and that's why we have such a, such a great system right now within G Suite. Finally, you want to consider where is the data stored. Google is a global provider of cloud services, so we have data centers globally. You need to know where that information is. You need to know where those data centers are. So again, you can conduct a meaningful risk assessment. I'll talk a little bit about data centers and the risk assessment that we conduct when we choose a data center location. And then finally, you want to think about third-party security audits um, with regards to whether or not we're inviting third parties to review our systems to make sure we're doing what we say we're doing. These are the questions, examples of questions that you should be asking of a cloud provider, questions that we've been developing answers to over the course of many years since we've been doing this. The first distinction I absolutely must make, and I have to dedicate some time to it specifically here, is to Distinguish G Suite and consumer apps. G Suite and the consumer app counterparts look very, very similar. And in fact, the similarities is somewhat of a double-edged sword when it comes to Google and our customers. The similarity is fantastic because it makes it a lot easier for end users, for example. Your, when I say end users, I mean your own employees or students. End users are familiar with the consumer services. It makes the utilization of these similar services in the work environment very easy. If they know how to use consumer Gmail, it's very likely they know how to use the business counterpart within G Suite. The same goes for docs uh, in the business sense. and con uh, You get the idea. However, there's a significant difference between the two, as I mentioned earlier. First of all, data is not used to create ads or to display ads. Right? We provide commitments in our data processing amendment, data processing terms that restrict how we can use your data. See, that's important for regulated markets. The other difference is that G Suite provides customers, and specifically their administrators, with an administrator console, a C panel, a control panel. And the administrators are responsible for determining who in their organization gets accounts, whether their password should be reset, password enforceability, 
um, whether or not their account should be turned off, what uh, systems or what applications they're allowed to use, how much data they have, whether they're allowed to share outside, share outside the organization. Our customers are responsible for doing this. They are in control, right? We provide the back-end systems that allow for this, but they are the administrators. Compare that to a consumer Gmail account where there is no system administrator. You simply uh, go to Google and create your own account and decide what you want to do with it on your own. The business and environment and the enterprise environment is very different. And then finally, in the enterprise context, and I just want to touch on it, um, we also provide special enterprise-related functionality, such as what's available in Google Vault, which allows for special retention with regards to the data that your end users may store in the system. But again, I need to make the distinction. In G Suite, we will not serve ads, and uh, data won't be used uh, for any other purpose than to provide the services as outlined in our data processing terms. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's the compliance assessment. The questions you want to ask, the things you want to consider uh, as you adopt a cloud provider. <coughs> However, everything I could be saying to you about what our capabilities are could be wrong. I could be standing here just lying to you about what our capabilities are, what everyone has been telling you all week. They could all be lies and lies and lies. <laughs> so how do you know that they're not lies? You have to be able to verify what we're saying is true, at least from a regulatory compliance perspective. I worked with regulators for a long time, specifically about cloud, and they're certainly adopting the idea of cloud computing. Many regulatory authorities have actually issued guidance with respect to cloud but they still expect customers to conduct a meaningful risk assessment. And you can't conduct a risk assessment unless there's some sort of transparency into what we're doing. And that's where third-party certifications and audits come in. It's very important for this. Um, this is not something we did when we first launched, um, back in the day, Gmail for your domain, or Google Apps, as, as we used to previously call G Suite. But we realized as larger and larger customers adopted our services, adopted G Suite, they wanted to know whether we were actually doing what we say we're doing. And how do we do that with millions and millions of customers? Well, we didn't have to invent this process. There are third-party auditors that we can invite into our systems, into our, into our data centers, to review our processes and analyze what we're doing specifically and verify what we're doing is actually what we say we're doing. Um, so up here you see a, a lot of uh, pretty little badges and logos. I'll give you a little summary of what they mean. The first thing that's very important in conducting a risk assessment is an analysis of the SOC 2 report that an auditor might provide. Now, basically what we do when it comes to a SOC examination, and uh, I'm going to cover this very high level because that's the best I can do, is we invite third-party auditors uh, to review our processes, our systems, our data centers, and to verify that the controls that we implement are actually being followed. And the output of their analysis is a very detailed, what we call a SOC 2 audit report several hundred pages, two or three hundred pages long, that give you a detailed description of what's happening. We also offer a SOC 3, which is also a synopsis, basically, of that, sum, of that, uh, of that review. The SOC 2 report is highly confidential, very detailed, but quite useful when it comes to conducting a risk assessment. So what you want to do is you want to look at that detailed SOC 2 audit report, um, or even the SOC 3, which is publicly available, and then compare that to what your own security capabilities are or security requirements. And then you can conduct an analysis or a comparison between the two to ensure that there aren't any gaps that you might need to address. Um, the other thing that you want to think about, and so that's a SOC 2, right? It's a review of controls that we've implemented by a third-party auditor to verify that what we're saying is true. Okay. Now we have something which is slightly different, ISO. International um, Standard, Organization for Standardization, ISO. ISO 27001, 17, and 18. This is where we have third-party auditors come in and audit us against a, a specific standard. ISO, as many of you might know, is a global organization that sets standards. They'll set a security standard. They'll set a data protection standard. They set standards in all sorts of industries. But the thing that's become very important to us as a provider of cloud services are their security standards. So what we've done is we've, been, and this was a few years later after we started doing SOC-related reports and uh, SAS 70 reports prior to that, is we'd invite auditors in to assess us against this standard. 
ISO says that if you want to comply with 27001, you have, to, you have to do these things. And if you do these things, and if they are verified by an auditor, then you get a certification, a diploma, basically. So, for several years now, we've been audited against ISO 27001. And if you're curious about what those controls are that we're audited against, you can actually contact ISO and order a copy of the standard so you can see what we're complying with. More recently, and ISO, as I mentioned, ISO 27001 is a security standard. More recently, um, ISO has issued uh, 27,017, which are controls that are specific to cloud security. Cloud security. And um, naturally, <laughs> we have adopted ISO 27,017 and have been audited against that as well. And then ISO 27,018 is a separate standard that is geared towards data protection and privacy. It's a privacy standard for the cloud. So we've also adopted this, reviewed the controls, and had auditors examine us with respect to the requirements of ISO 27018. Then also at the bottom, these are industry and region-specific certifications or frameworks. We're also FedRAMP certified, which is a US government certification that allows us to provide services to certain government agencies. Um, we also accept HIPAA data which is uh, United States healthcare information, protected health information. And then we also participate in privacy shield and model clauses. I'll get to that in a couple of slides. The point of this is, though, is we undergo these third-party audits for a reason. It's very expensive, and it takes a long time. It's so that you have a means of verifying what we're saying and verifying that what we say we do is actually what we do. Just to give you a sense of, and this is really just a high-level summary of the type of objectives and controls that would, be, that, would be, uh, that would be reviewed when we subject ourselves to an ISO-type audit. Obviously, we talk about information security and privacy compliance, but it also talks about things like human resources or, um, or the scope of the standard, what we do in, with respect to incident management. Remember when I talked about if there's, you know, hopefully there's ne never going to be the case, but if there's a data incident, being able to provide you information about it and in a timely manner, that's part of one of these standards. Cryptography, whether or not we're encrypting the data and in, in what manner. The scope of processing. Remember I mentioned that we obligate ourselves to limit how data is processed pursuant to our enterprise uh, data processing amendment? That's part of the standard as well. So if someone asks you, well, how do you know Google isn't using data for advertising purposes? We can point to the ISO audits. And in this one, in this case, I think it's ISO 27,018. This gives you a general sense. But, but again, if you want to, as part of your risk assessment, if you really want to conduct your due diligence, then obtain a copy of these controls from ISO. ISO 27,001 security. ISO 27,017 cloud security and ISO 27018 cloud privacy and review the controls. Then you'll get a sense of what we actually audit against and what our capabilities are. This, along with the, <clears throat> the SOC 2 report I mentioned, that very detailed two to 300 page summary, or the SOC 3, which is publicly available, will give you a sense of what our overall computer, uh, security capabilities are, as well as data protection capabilities, and then compare it to what your own needs are. There are also lots of other online resources. Um, we have reactive, oh, sorry, we have FAQs, we have white papers, we have documents that describe our processes outside of these audit reports. You should take a look at them. You should avail yourselves of these resources. Um, we create these for people that are in regulated industries, but it doesn't hurt even if you don't think you're dealing with regulated information. You're not a bank, you're not dealing with European personal data or student records or educational records. That's okay. You can take a look at these and get a sense of what we're actually doing. It gives information about how we encrypt the data, uh, general overviews about security and compliance, our data centers. We have security frequently asked questions. So the next thing I want to talk about are our data centers. As I mentioned, we have a, and, and this is publicly available, by the way. If you do a search for Google Data Center, you'll be able to find this page. But this is a general overview of where we have production data centers that Google owns and operates that we use for uh, systems that would involve G Suite. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about why we have chosen these particular data centers and why these locations are important to us. Um, so first of all, there are considerations that you might not be surprised to learn. 
For example, bandwidth is obviously a big issue for us. We want to make sure that the data centers enjoy fast internet connectivity, which results in extremely low latency and re at reasonable prices to us. Um, and we also want to make sure that there are multiple and diverse fiber paths to the data center where we might choose to have it built. And notice we have distributed data centers based on that, uh, based on that criteria. Cost, as I had alluded to a little bit earlier, cost is also very important. We want to make sure that the location would allow for energy efficiency and provide, if, if possible, renewable energy options. Right? These are all engineering-driven uh, considerations. But from a compliance perspective, it goes a little bit further than that. Right? We also want to consider policy issues. For example, we don't want to build a data center uh, in a place that does not have political stability, that does not have a rule of law. We don't want to see a data center nationalized, for example. We want to make sure that the countries we might choose um, has, a, has a good human rights record or is, or is, a, or is proponent of democracy, um, does not censor political considerations. Right? We have to be able to defend our rights and the rights of our users when we build a data center in a country, and that's why rule of law is critical. So for example, where we build a data center might also determine, for example, whether we have the ability to protect ourselves and our users in courts by the mere fact we have a data center there. It goes beyond that also. We want to make sure that content is not going to be a problem. The country that we build a data center in should allow us to be able to protect ourselves against um, copyright infringement claims, or defamation, or trademark. Right? So we have to consider any exposure there. And finally, you won't see data centers in any countries where we, as a, as a, as a cloud provider, aren't allowed to do business with people in that country. Right? There are countries that are, we are prohibited from even considering or doing business in. That might be on the OFAC restricted list. These are the considerations. And again, um, you should know where the data is stored as part of your risk assessment. And I should also let you know that since we do utilize a global distributed network system, um, you should also consider that uh, when you determine the type of data you store. Right? But you should also remember that it's quite possible that when you think there are restrictions to, for example, things that might relate to data sovereignty, they might not actually be the case. For example, uh, when it comes to European personal data, we actually provide and undertake to utilize frameworks that allow the export of personal data from Europe. A lot of people don't know that, but it can be done, and it's, it's done quite readily. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So we talked about transparency, right? third-party audit reports, SOC 2, ISO certifications, white papers, publicly available information, uh, FAQs. That's how you can do your due diligence. But how do you know that as soon as you sign up, we don't do any of it, right? Well, we change our minds. Oh, we don't want to do third-party audits, right? Too much trouble, too expensive. You have to have it in writing. That's where the contracts come in. And this is where I can show you where we put it in writing and where you can find it. So we basically offer three different uh, uh, means by which we provide these obligations to you. First of all, there's, of course, the customer agreement. Um, this is what you would click through when you sign up for G Suite for business or for education or other versions of G Suite. It provides your commercial terms, how much you're going to pay and for what, uh, billing and payments information, things like technical support, SLAs. It also talks about your data remains yours, intellectual property. Remember I mentioned that as one of the risk assessments questions? Who owns the data when you upload it into a cloud provider system? So you do. That's where we talk about it. But my favorite part, which I talk about with respect to data protection and regulatory compliance, are the data processing terms. We actually have an amendment that anyone that uses G Suite um, can opt into through the admin console. Remember I mentioned the admin console that provides for the data protection obligations that we impose on ourselves as your cloud provider. We talk about privacy compliance. We talk about the restriction on data use. We maintain the obligation, or rather, we, 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 uh, we impose the obligation on ourselves to maintain these third-party audits, which have to be done periodically. We talk about things like data deletion, making sure that when you delete a file, it's actually deleted. Again, we think about these things because it comes up over the years. You can leverage our, our familiarity with this process and regulatory environment. 
And then, of course, not everyone in the world is the same. We leverage uh, global standards for our third-party audit reports because we want it to be able to encompass as many customers as possible so we don't block off or, or, or fail to serve a certain segment of the market. But we also provide region or industry-specific terms based on the size of the market and how much of a need. Um, and I'll talk about model clauses a little bit later, but that's something specific to European privacy compliance, what allows the export of personal data to a global network of data centers. We provide business associates agreements, which is contractual assurances to our users or to our customers that need to process HIPAA information, PHI, patient information, it's protected. We also provide FSI, uh, financial services industry, special audit language that some uh, Googlers here in the room that have helped worked very hard to help us create, which will address the specific regulatory requirements of our customers in the financial services industry. And then finally, as I mentioned, we provide uh, clauses related to our FedRAMP certification, which is U.S. certification that allows certain government agencies to use us for moderate-level data. So this is generally the construct. You have the base customer agreement, then you have specific data processing terms, and then you have region or industry-specific terms that might be um, available for you depending on where you're coming to us from. Let's drill down into the data processing terms. So, the data processing terms are, in addition to our product's function, is really what makes the enterprise service stand out from the consumer service. The consumer service, the consumer privacy policy. This is where you have the business-oriented data protection obligations. It's, it's, it's essentially like the privacy policy for the enterprise service that we're providing. Um, as I mentioned, it's available via the admin console, and it was created with feedback over the years from customers and regulatory authorities alike. We work with everybody to get feedback uh, on this globally available data processing amendment, we call it. It's available to anyone in the world, and um, all you need to do is opt in, and it's very important. But let's talk a little bit about, again, what some of the obligations are. And you'll see some of these pair directly to what I was mentioning as part of the initial risk assessment of the cloud provider as well as things we talked about with relation to audits. We include a limitation on processing. We include a restriction on using the data for ads or for serving ads. We obligate ourselves to actually delete the data when you delete it. In other words, um, if you take an email and you delete it from the inbox and then you empty your trash, right? we provide an obligation that we will wipe the data within a certain period of time. And similar to the ISO certifications and the number of security engineers we have and our security capabilities, this is likely a significant step up from what people do on-prem. I don't know a lot of people that actually wipe data from their servers every time a piece of data is deleted. You may do it, but I'll bet that many folks don't. Um, we maintain an obligation, as I mentioned earlier, to, to have these third-party auditors come in regularly and create these audit reports so you can review them. In addition to making sure we maintain these audit reports throughout the contract, throughout the term of the contract, we make sure we maintain our certifications, the ISO certifications, for example. We also tell you, and this is something we've done it with, close, uh, with close consultation with regulatory authorities, particularly in Europe, is that we provide information to you about our sub-processors. So what are sub-processors? These are third parties, non-Google Inc. entities that we would use to process the data. So, for example, Google has engineers all over the place, and we have um, data centers. So this basically is information to you about our own subsidiaries that process data for you, Google companies themselves that would be involved with processing. We also have information about the number of vendors we use that would process data as well. Now, as you can imagine, as Google, we don't use many vendors for processing data. We, I think right now, the last time I checked, we had less than 10, but still, it's good to know who they are, and we make it available to you as part of your risk assessment. We also provide an obligation to notify you, for example, with regards to these vendors, if the vendor is going to change. So you know ahead of time, just in case it's of, an interest, if it's, if it's of interest to you. Again, transparency, an obligation to provide you with information so you can conduct a meaningful risk assessment. By the way, I should tell you that a lot of these obligations come out of Europe. For our data protection, framework, data processing amendment, data processing terms, and as you'll learn later, a lot of our work is based on the European model. 
because from a data protection and personal data standpoint, they offer some of the most stringent data protection requirements in the world. So we hope that if we achieve this standard, it will be useful to the rest of the world to a certain degree. Now, of course, everyone has their own requirements. Every country has their own requests, their own needs. But by using a high standard like Europe for data protection, as well as using um, globally accepted third-party auditing uh, mechanisms and certifications, we can create a framework that is applicable to as many customers worldwide as possible. So we also talk about uh, our security measures. We give, you a, uh, we give you an overview of the security capabilities. We provide an obligation to notify you in the event of a data incident, right? Remember, I keep talking about that. This is where we promise to do it in writing. And then finally, if, there's, if there are further questions or you need further information, we provide a link to be able to contact the data privacy officer um, to be able to get more information. So that's contracts. I didn't make it too long. I didn't want to make anybody crazy. Besides, there are no lawyer, there aren't hardly any lawyers in the room, or no one at all admit it anyway. Um, regulatory frameworks, let's talk about that. So, I mentioned that we try to provide a service that is useful to as many customers worldwide as possible. But I've also said that we have a lot of experience with dealing with regulatory authorities in markets that we've served over the world. I want to talk to you a little about some of these markets and how we have addressed them directly, and also what we've seen from a trends perspective. So naturally, the first thing I'm going to talk about is EU. You've heard me mention that EU data protection uh, frameworks are particularly stringent, and it's something that we work very hard to address always, and we intend to do so. So let's talk a little bit about EU privacy compliance. Um, and I'm going to start this story with the EU Data Protection Directive of 1995. This was a very important piece of legislation that basically directed all the member states of Europe to pass their own privacy laws that mirrored this directive. That's why it's called a directive. It directs the member states to do that. One of the most important aspects of the Data Protection Directive, besides uh, the protection of personal data, um, data controller, data processor relationship, the obligations of the parties, I'm not going to get into too much detail on that, but the prohibition on exporting personal data from Europe to any country that did not maintain adequate privacy protections as determined by Europe. Well, when the Data Protection Directive was being drafted prior to 1995, this was also prior to when the internet was being used for commerce generally. And that's totally different, huge shift. Now you've got personal data flying everywhere. Email address, a name, a picture, emailing from one person to another. It made the aspect of locating personal data in a region where it could be enforced particularly difficult. Well, the first thing that happened with relation to that, and I'm going to talk about this from the cloud perspective, is that um, the European Commission created the US-EU Safe Harbor Framework. Who here has heard of Safe Harbor? Wow, see, a lot has happened in the news with regards to Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor was a special framework that was created between the United States Department of Commerce and the European Commission that would allow the flow of personal data from Europe to the United States, to companies in the United States, I should say, that opt to participate in this Safe Harbor program. And thousands and thousands of companies signed up to do this, including Google. We imported data pursuant to the Safe Harbor framework. Um, but that covered the United States for cloud providers. In 2010, the European C Commission created a framework that would allow the export of personal data to anywhere in the world. And that was a mechanism they called model contract clauses. I won't go into too much detail, but basically it was form language that they created where if this language exists in the contract between the customer and, in, this, in our case, the cloud provider, then data could flow anywhere in the world, pursuant to the requirements in the model clauses. Now, it's not just a question of a cloud provider copying and pasting this language, this boilerplate language, into a, into a contract. The obligations in the model clauses are, are significant and serious and expensive and, and difficult for us to do, but we did it, and we do it. And we began, we began offering model clauses somewhere around, two, I think, December of 2012. So we offered customers Safe Harbor, which was built into all of our services and, frankly, used all across Google. And then for G Suite, we offered model clauses as another way 
to export personal data from Europe, sort of a parallel framework, both. And we started doing that in 2012. And then what happened most recently with Safe Harbor? Gone. It was ruled invalid by Europe's highest court. Now, in our case, of course, we never could have anticipated that that's would have ha that would have happened with Safe Harbor. But we did, thankfully, offer this parallel framework for model clauses for several years before this happened. So our customers had an alternative framework to do this, for this data export. This is important, even if you are not based in Europe, by the way. If you're a multinational uh, company or organization that has end users in Europe, that are, or users that are European citizens, this is also important. Um, and then, of course, the Department of Commerce and the European Commission created Privacy Shield as a replacement for Safe Harbor. So we also offer Privacy Shield as well. So we have model clauses and we have Privacy Shield. This is, again, for the export of personal data from Europe, important for a multinational data center uh, or cloud provider that uses international data centers. We also have a contractual obligation, which I didn't include in the, in the, uh, in the data processing term slide, but I should talk about it, where we promise to maintain an alternative framework to stay a step ahead as the law changes with regards to export of personal data. Now, with respect to model clauses, I should note that when Safe Harbor was invalidated, pretty much all we were left with for G Suite was model clauses as a mechanism to export personal data. And we had millions and millions of customers uh, in Europe or those that had users in Europe that we needed to protect. So, being that we had model clauses specifically, we needed to make sure that data protection regulators actually agreed that our use of them addressed um, European requirements for the export of personal data. So along those lines, we submitted our contracts, our contractual agreement, the, uh, the data processing amendment I mentioned, as well as our own model clauses for review by data protection regulators in Europe, pursuant to a framework that was created by the Article 29 Working Party. Now, the Article 29 Working Party is basically the group of all European data protection regulators. They created a process by which a, a, a provider's terms could be reviewed, and the model clauses could be assessed as to whether or not they achieve European requirements for the export of personal data. And I'm happy to say that after a year of hard work, discussions with the data protection regulators, uh, review of our contracts, changes as necessary, uh, we obtained approval from the data protection regulators that reviewed our model clauses. And again, we do this because it's very important for all of our users who maintain uh, businesses in Europe or have end users in Europe. So basically what this means is that model clauses, our customers that are in Europe that use model clauses, don't need to get special permission from their data protection regulators to export personal data. And for those and for other countries, it makes the process much, more, uh, much easier. This makes it much easier for our customers to conduct a risk assessment. Uh, if we have any German privacy lawyers in here, they would know exactly what we mean. And as I mentioned, it was conducted pursuant to Article 29 Working Party Guidance, the group of all European data protection regulators. As part of this process, the lead data protection regulator who conducted this assessment was the Irish DPA, Ireland. And as part of this process, there are two co-reviewers, two other data protection regulators that review this on behalf of Europe. And the co-reviewers uh, were the Spanish Data Protection Authority, who provided, also provided a lot of great feedback, and also the Hamburg, Germany Data Protection Regulator. And for people that operate in data protection space, to have a, a regulator based in Germany sign off on model clauses, that's a big deal. And we're very, very happy to, pro to be providing this to our customers. So we can't talk about Europe without discussing the general data protection regulation, the GDPR. Who here has heard of the GDPR? That's great. I'm glad to hear that. And as I tell my, my colleagues, the engineering and product management colleagues, GDPR does not mean groovy disco party revolution. <laughs> I try to explain this to them. So you remember in that slide where I started with the data protection directive in 1995 and how that was created prior to the internet being used for commerce, really, and how that created a lot of interesting, interesting situations for companies that export personal data regularly, using the internet, for example. So Europe decided to update 
the EU Data Protection Directive and create a new version with a lot of changes and a lot of improvements, which will take effect in May 2018. And notice, I just should point out, that this is going to be called the General Data Protection Regulation and not a directive. They didn't just do this to confuse us. The idea is that the problem with the directive was that, remember I mentioned each country passed their own version? Each version in each country was slightly different and made customers and us kind of crazy. Cloud providers were getting a little loopy with it. Customers didn't know how to interpret it. So to try to create consistency across all of Europe, or the EU, I should say, they made this a regulation so that it has direct force of law. Now, what's nice about this from a cloud provider perspective is that a lot of the things that we've already been doing for several years, pursuant to EU guidance from the Article 29 Working Party, like what cloud providers should be doing, they have working party opinions with regards to that, data protection, obligations that were in the model clauses I mentioned, a lot of those are going to now be included in the data protection regulation. So from a data protection perspective, it's very helpful for us as a provider. It also maintains the same data transfer, similar data transfer mechanisms that I talked about. Remember I mentioned uh, model clauses and privacy shield? Those types of data export mechanisms uh, are going to be consistent and be maintained within the GDPR. They may be tweaked, they may be updated, but the core concept still remains. However, there are things that are new. From a data protection perspective, previously, and the way it is today, um, customers in Europe, they are the ones that are responsible for compliance with the data protection requirements in each of their countries. They are the ones who are beholden to their regulators. Now, we provide all of these European-centric data protection commitments to our customers because they need it as customers in Europe or customers with European end users, and also because it's, it's important for us as a business to make sure they have what they need to be protected and to use our systems. With the, data protection with the uh, general data protection regulation, the GDPR, now the providers are also going to be directly responsible for to the data protection regulators in Europe. So not only our customers, but the cloud providers as well. That gets our attention. The other thing is that there is a very strict timeline when it comes to data incident or breach notification. Right? That's a really big deal. Now, as I mentioned, for years we've been providing data breach obligations or data incident notification obligations, but now they've got a real, uh, very challenging timeline which has uh, gotten the attention of the entire industry as well as the customer base. Also, fines. Fines are, are, are extremely high now for non-compliance. So that also gets attention of the consumers and the providers as well. And there's also an express requirement for data portability which didn't exist in prior guidance. Remember we talked about the obligation to be able to allow you to take your data and go home, move to a different provider? That's now actually in the regulation. So, from a compliance perspective, um, we're in pretty good shape, um, but we are definitely focusing on the uh, regulation which is going to be passing, or I should say, taking effect next year. And, and stay tuned for more information. We're absolutely gonna be uh, updating you with this. Now, as I mentioned, this section talks about the regulatory framework we see most often. And I can't talk about the millions of combinations in every country. But I can talk about general key themes as well. So as I would mentioned, the risk assessment, how important that is, and, and the ability to look at a provider's terms and audit reports and certifications. If I, talk, if I, if I, if I want to talk about a common theme across industries and across regulators and across countries, that's it conducting a meaningful risk assessment. Don't just use Google because we're Google, right? I've actually, seen, I've actually seen someone get in trouble with a regulatory authority because they didn't do a risk assessment. Now again, this doesn't mean that everyone is beholden to a regulator or anyone deals with regulated data. But if you do, just, just do your homework. You know, just so that way, one day, if you ever do have to talk to your regulator, you can say, yes, I did my due diligence. Um, here are the, he, this, these are the reports that I reviewed. Here's a summary. Here are the certifications that they have. Here are white papers. Here's our customer agreement where our obligations are outlined. That's a really common, that's a really a common theme I see. And you also want to, as I mentioned before, and, I, and, I, and again, it's important to stress, you want to think about the type of data you're storing. Most of our customers, our millions of customers, can store all of their data. 
but there might be some that are dealing with classified information or certain corpses of data that might otherwise be restricted. Regulatory authorities also like to maintain oversight. So if you're a bank and you're regulated by your banking regulator, they have to have the ability to audit you. I used to be a financial, day, years ago when I was practicing law in the, in the regulated market space, I was a financial regulator. And we had to have the right as regulators to audit our customers' records. So if you're a bank, and we have banks that are customers, and you move to the cloud, you have to think about how you're going to maintain that access for your regulators. Um, are you going to grant them an administrator account so they can access the data? What's going to be the process for doing this? Just think about it. The regulatory, the regulatory authorities also expect that regulated industries like banks have to be able to provide, uh, have to be able to audit us directly. Audit us directly, not just look at our audit reports, right? And the other thing to think about is that many regulatory authorities already have guidance on adopting cloud. So don't think that you have to do this from scratch or you have to rely just on everything I'm telling you. It's very possible that they may already have guidance. I know lots of countries that already have guidance with regards to cloud adoption. Um, so from a financial services perspective and from an FSI perspective, as I'd mentioned, um, we work very hard to create special terms for banks, for example, that give them these types of rights. It gives the customer the right to audit us directly. It even gives their regulators the right to audit us directly. We'd prefer them to use the third-party audit reports, <laughs> but it is there if they need it. They could even verify the physical controls of our data center. We don't like to open up our data center floor. It's very private, and it's, again, it's a security issue, but if there must be an audit or a verification, we can make that happen as well for certain customers of a certain size, for example, in the financial services industry. So these are the trends, for example, in FSI. But let's talk about other areas. You heard me talk about the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, and just remember that that involves um, whether or not you can store protected health information, PHI, in the cloud. And I'm happy to say that after many years of saying no, my saying no, we can now say yes, you can store PHI in the cloud. It's something that we work very hard for because of customer demand, market demand in the United States. I should mention, by the way, that this is a U.S. framework. HIPAA has, does not apply to other countries, but it's very important for, for, uh, for customers that deal with PHI. Think about a research, think about a university that wants to adopt G Suite, and they have a research hospital. And remember I told you to think about the types of data that would be stored in the cloud? Um, before we agreed to store HIPAA data, universities could use us for all of their staff, all of their students, all of their professors, except they couldn't store PHI. Now they can, because we uh, will sign a business associates agreement. We've also provided our customers with a HIPAA implementation guide, basically an instruction manual on how to use G Suite if you're going to store PHI data. Speaking of G Suite for Education, um, we also take into, take into consideration FERPA, the U.S. Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. I'm glad it's written up there for me. This involves the protection and restrictions on how you could process or store um, student records or student directory information. That's also something we take into consideration to help our customers that would like to adopt G Suite. Again, these won't be applicable to everyone in the room, but just to show that we are paying attention to this for customers. And then finally, uh, with the US government, um, you heard me talk about FedRAMP. We have an authorization to operate an ATO um, at the FIPS 199 moderate impact level. So this allows government agencies to utilize our services pursuant to this FedRAMP certification. And then as long as we're talking about governments, um, the United Kingdom, we subscribe to the NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Center Cloud Security Principles, which allows for government adoption in certain markets within Europe. And also, uh, we're also featured on the government G Cloud Marketplace through our partners. So, as I had mentioned, we try to provide as broad a framework as possible to apply to as many customers as possible. And within select markets, we can also provide more, such as Europe, healthcare, education, and government. And we're working on more and more of these frameworks uh, for G Suite, as well as in um, 
Google Cloud Platform, which you've heard about um, in other parts of this, uh, this week's sessions. And yes, uh, we do have a number of banks that have adopted our services. And we have also worked directly with many regulatory authorities uh, throughout the world. As a matter of fact, uh, the Dutch National Bank, which is up there in blue, um, they actually provided us with direct authorization to provide services to banks. So banks, are, they've already authorized G Suite as a provider to banks in that country based on the extensive engagement that we've undertaken with, with the DNB. Now, not all regulators do that. They don't, they don't verify spe specific vendors. Other regulators will issue cloud guidance that you might see in other countries like in the UK or in Australia. But in many other cases, we'll work directly with the regulatory authorities to provide information about our services, get their feedback. The other thing we do is, in many cases, remember I mentioned that sometimes regulators will issue cloud guidance, right? So in many cases, thankfully, the regulators actually talk to the cloud providers so they know a little bit about what they're writing. So in many cases, we'll provide guidance to regulatory authorities. And in some cases, we'll work with regulators directly along with our customers, depending on, depending on the country or the market. Um, so this is just a small example of some of the regulators that I have worked with directly or my peers, uh, as well as our customers. So let's see, what have we talked about today? We've talked about the importance of conducting a, an assessment of your cloud provider and of G Suite. Um, you may not be in a regulated market. You may not be dealing with regulated data. But you should think about it and conduct that assessment if you are, specifically. We talked about the transparency resources we provide. Uh, Third-party audit reports, certifications, ISO, white papers, frequently asked questions document, online resources to make sure that we're doing what we say we're doing, and then making sure that we put it in writing, where to find these terms. And by the way, if you want to see the G Suite data processing amendment, just do a search for G Suite data processing amendment. You'll find it. And then finally, I gave you an example of some of the most common regulatory frameworks that we've been addressing over the last few years based on our experience in providing this to the business. But ultimately, the takeaway is that we'd like you to consider partnering with Google for data protection and compliance. You know your industry, we know the cloud, and together we can really do a lot. And if you would like more information generally, please uh, find us on the web, google.com slash G Suite. And uh, I'd like to thank you for listening and can also take questions for a few minutes if anyone has them. Thank you very much, folks.